now, according to the confirmed cases of uh, COVID-19 globally, have crossed a threshold of nearly a quarter of a billion, 223 million cases of COVID so far, Luke. That's right. And every Friday, actually, a global update comes out, and I read it avidly, obviously. And last Friday struck me as a very interesting moment, in a way. This, this assesses the whole world, so it's a, it's a long document. And then it also assesses therapies and vaccines and the whole thing, you know. But yeah, we've reached 223 million cases, 4.6 million deaths now have been confirmed from this virus, and they're quite significant numbers, obviously. Nowhere near as much as the 1918 pandemic yet, thankfully, but still, it's heading in that direction. Is the, Are is the, the numbers concern. still lower than they're 1918? still lower, yeah, yeah. That was 50 million million people died we think now it's hard to measure back in 1918 1919 but but it's a lot less than that still but still 4.6 million deaths and as you say a quarter of a billion cases and these are probably underestimates because the full range of testing wouldn't be as extensive but still it's an indicator and then it goes through every country and every kind of continent and gives us the current situation with, di- with significant disparity between Big differences the best and worst to yes. use that phrase well there was good news South, Af- South America has turned a corner so cases are declining was the big big uh, bottom line there Brazil cases are going downwards uh, same in Argentina and Colombia since late July they think they began to turn in those countries and then cases start to plummet which is a great thing to see and of course partly it's vaccination uh, 60% are now uh, partially vaccinated in Brazil and Argentina in Uruguay Chile 70% fully vaccinated so they've really done well and then you're combining that with natural infection and then that will of course fight the virus as well so they were, they were quite good numbers but then the bad side was South East Asia they're doing worse so they're, they're going the other way in a sense you know and some of those numbers are a bit more a bit more disturbing so you get this kind of overall global picture of, of quite a mixed picture but still the signs are immunity is building up in the world which is great through natural infection and then you combine that with vaccines then we're heading in the, in the right direction overall When you look at, at um, disparity in the numbers like that to what do you attribute it? Is it, is it different public health measures? Is it is different vaccination? Is it the behaviour of the virus itself? It's, it's complicated. It's very complicated. There often isn't a one-liner in a sense and it must be the, the virus itself and the, the Delta of course is the big issue now. So one reason why Southeast Asia is in trouble I think is there wasn't much outbreaks there before like Vietnam had done very well in the first phase. Delta comes along it's more transmissible it starts to spread much more you see. So now what that tells us is some countries would have built up more natural immunity in the previous variants, if you will, that protect against Delta. If you didn't have that previous immunity, when Delta comes in, things get worse, or if you're not vaccinated. So that was one reason. Vietnam is is the one that they really flagged in this report. Actually, massive spike happening. Uh, There were hardly any. There were 35 deaths up to April. There's now 13,000 deaths in Vietnam, you see. And uh, 4,000 cases. Half a million cases in Vietnam, you see, in that few months. So this massive surge has happened there, you see. And then that's obviously concern for the Vietnamese and yet again the vaccination campaign was slow you know 3.3 million out of 96 million were fully vaccinated in Vietnam so that's that's a small proportion which means they're having to do all the things that we had to do previously like lockdowns Ho Chi Minh City lockdown since mid-August is that right? It's 80% of the numbers in Vietnam are in Ho Chi Minh City first of all and now that city is in total lockdown since August 23rd it'll stay in lockdown probably for two more weeks just to get a handle on this because it's running so fast there you see and then of course they're trying to ramp up vaccination so, so each country is, a, is at a different stage and has its own story is, is the way it's going. You talked about how Delta changed the um, reality for Vietnam. What then of things like Mu and other variants that are coming out? What's yeah, we're, the well, we're watching those, as you know, and Mu and, and Lambda with the two. These are variants of interest, not yet of concern, which means there's no evidence that they're worse than Delta, but they're still different. And there's three differences in Mu that we look at closely and wonder what do they mean because we don't know what they mean yet. You know, in other words, you can, it's slightly different to the previous one. So they've been watched now the, the good news there was they haven't taken over South America. Um, uh, Mew began in Colombia and that hasn't become dominant there. At least it, it was dominant for a while but now it's sort of in abeyance, you know. But again, we don't know. I mean, this is, this is the, as you know, we discussed before, the big unanswered scientific question is variants. Now, the good signs are if cases fall, vaccines go up, less chance of variants so and South America is heading in that direction so we're probably less likely to see variants from South America and I assume that one of the things that from your perspective is advantageous when you have this level of case numbers is you have huge cohorts to study to look at how variants are developing yeah yeah I mean it's an incredible story from an immunologist's point of view actually Anton, because this is a global pandemic remember which is incredible that just even to say that we're still struck at the enormity of it aren't we we're st- and it's 18 months in all over the world this is spreading different countries different measures you can imagine the number 
remember a PhD theses will come out of this because all the analysis that's happening is really informative. And of course, that could be useful then for, for future ones. But you're quite right. It's like one massive sort of pandemic happening in all these countries. And we're all looking very closely at what's happening. And it is, in, in the most positive sense, it is being exploited by all of the pharmaceutical companies. We're seeing drugs and vaccine trials fit to beat the band. Now, here's the update. It's the next part of the update. And to be honest, 17 vaccines are approved now. And I didn't realize there's so many. Like, I knew we had the four that we have in Ireland, you know. But there's other ones. The Sinovac, there's the famous Sputnik, you know, and then other ones as well. So 17 are now being marketed globally. And well, are they all RNA? No, they're a mixture. Yeah, some are RNA. Some of these called adenoviral vector ones. There's probably four different types at the moment, actually, if you think roughly. So, in other words, there's all these vaccines now being deployed. I mean, can you imagine that this disease was only discovered 18 months ago? That's the other striking thing that gets me, you know. And then the US on Friday, again, this is in this report, they're now mandating vaccines for all companies of more than 100 employees, right? They've said that that's what people should do. And if an employee won't uh, take a vaccine, they've got to be tested every week. That's the kind of other side of it, in a way. But they're, they're encouraging every company with more than 100 to make sure you vaccinate all your staff. And of course, they've, they also said last week, all federal employees have to be fully vaccinated. That's now, in other words, that's the government is your boss there, saying you have to be vaccinated. Isn't so. it remarkable for a country that so prides itself itself on civil liberties, that they would be willing to accept the kind of actions that on this side of the water, there would be uproar if it they is, tried to bring them yeah. in. And there's kickback. Certain states are saying no, you know, so we'll see what happens next. But this, this is the federal government trying to do its best by its people, I suppose, at one level. And they're saying that this is what we think you should do. It doesn't mean people are going to do it by any means, you know. But still, it was interesting, the US administration issued that very clear directive last week. On the topic of the 17 vaccines, is there likely to be any proxy benefit from the development of the COVID-19 vaccines as in is there a chance that we will discover do you know what while we're at it lads we've managed to create vaccines that are the basis to cure a lot of other stuff very much so I mean you can imagine the, the level of interest in vaccines in drug companies went up hugely because of COVID for obvious reasons and then they wonder can we use that technology now that we've used in COVID for malaria or TB or HIV they're the three big infectious diseases that kill a lot more people than COVID remember and we've been trying for decades to get vaccines for these diseases you see and failed but now this new technology the RNA in particular there's a trial with an HIV vaccine happening as we speak using RNA so again there's optimism I mean, in fact literally on Friday again I was talking to some of my vaccine friends and they were saying this is great for us because now we can really push this you know and get support for it and, and really try hard using these newer technologies and they're very optimistic they're going we may well crack it we may well get a vaccine for AIDS we may get one from it and of course it's early days I haven't said that but, you but can even see the, the fact that the May is possible. The May is there and, and the level of excitement among them is huge, you know, so it's a good development. What then about therapeutics? Because on, on the one hand you have the, the vaccines acting as prophylactic but you then have the issue of what do you do if somebody contracts it, how do you limit its impact all the rest of it. Is there significant development on that? There is and we need therapeutics because some people aren't vaccinated and they end up in hospital and, and the doctors will treat them, of course they will, you know and then secondly, a small number of people who are vaccinated may develop a severe disease it could be they have some underlying condition and the big question is, can we treat them and, and save them in hospital? And there are 19 marketed treatments now for this disease that you can now get, right? Uh, one is called remdesivir, that's antiviral for example. There's, there's these monoclonal antibodies which mop up the virus, they're approved in certain places. And I was amazed 19 are now available, you know. Now, not in every country obviously, but uh, but that's the total number. And then even more striking, there are 5,811 trials running with therapies as we speak. You see all these different approaches. Now you'd need to be very unlucky not to get some great therapies out of those trials. So when if there's 5,800 trials running does that mean that there are to the order of 5,000 individual medicines each being tried? Yep. It does. Separate medicines. Some are brand new. Some are repurposed drugs that were used for something else. They're trying everything. Now we knew this even a year ago they were throwing the kitchen sink at this because they knew we need therapies you see. These trials are now they'll be reporting soon. And again can you imagine if one or two of those work and really work extremely. The current therapies 20-30% efficacy you see. We must do better. Wouldn't it be marvellous if we got a full efficacy in hospital? Wouldn't that be tremendous? So again, these trials will hopefully yield even better medicines is the idea.